If you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. I'll be reading 8 through 12. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8 through 12. And the New King James Version reads as this. Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers, be tenderhearted, be courteous. Not returning evil for evil, or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing. Knowing that you were called for this, that you may inherit a blessing. For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain, refrain his tongue from evil, and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. You know, when I was a kid, I remember a little, I guess I call it a limerick, that went something like this. This is the church, and this is the steeple. Open it up, and here's all the people. You know, it's kind of cute and, and real rememberable, but the truth is it's, it's not real accurate because there's people right here, and that's what the church is. All right, the church is, is composed of people. It is people that, that we talk about when we talk about the church. It's not a building where people gather, but it's the people who gather together. And that's the church. And, and remembering that is so very important because it makes really the understanding of what Christ did for us that much more important and that much more meaningful. So in passages like, well, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 says, And you husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. See, it's people. It's, it's people, it's you and it's me that Christ gave himself for. And when Paul told the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, he said, Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. See, it tells us that it's people. It's, it's the souls of man that Christ hung on that cross for. It's people, it's the church, it's those of us who come together, it's those who have heard the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, it's those who believe in Jesus the Christ, it's, it's those who have confessed him as Lord and, and as, as, as ruler, as the Christ, as, as king of their life. It's, it's those people who have, because their Lord has told them how to live, they have repented of their sins. They have put him on in baptism to have those sins washed away. It's, it's, it's the church that the Lord died for. And what that tells me is this. If the Lord was willing to hang on the cross for the church, then obviously he loves them. Right? He loves the people. He, he loves the church. Uh, the church is very valuable to him. The, the church is precious to him. The church is called things like the bride of Christ, right? And, and those who are married know how valuable your bride is to you and how precious your bride is to you. And, and, and it's called the body of Christ, right? And, and you might remember passages like in Acts chapter 9. When, when Saul, that great persecutor of the church, was heading uh, to, to Damascus to, to gather Christians, to bind them and to bring them back to Jerusalem, to persecute them, the Lord came to Saul and, 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 and struck him blind with, with, this, with this piercing light that came from heaven. And he spoke down and he said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me, the church? He said, it's me. When you hurt the church, you hurt me. And so what that tells me, and, and, and I, I think it tells you as well, is this, that the church is precious to our Lord. That's not really the point of the lesson, but, but it brings us to it. You see, because the church is so precious to my Lord, then the church really needs to be precious to me. And because my, my Lord loves the church so much, then really I need to make sure that I love the church so much. Because, because the church is valuable to him and, and lovely to him and, and precious to him. I want the church to be that to me. Remember, we're talking about people. We're talking about you and me. We're talking about those who have been added to the church through baptism. We're talking about the church, the people who compose it. The Lord loves them. I need to love them. The Lord went through a lot for them. 
I need to go through a lot for them. Uh, I tell you, the lessons about how we treat the church, lessons about how I treat the church, that is to say, how do I treat the, the members of the Lord's church? How do I treat these people who love the Lord like I love the Lord, who care for the Lord like I care for the Lord, who have submitted to the Lord like I've submitted to the Lord? How should I treat these people? Well, we, we know it, it must be very well. I mean, Paul said this of all the world. He said in, in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10, he said, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all. Right? We as Christians should be people who do good to all people. We care for people. We love people. And we want to do good to everybody. As long as, as, as it's a person made in the image and likeness of God, which is everybody who walks this earth, I want to be good to that person. But Paul didn't stop there. He said, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, but especially, but especially to those who are, the, who are of the household of faith. See, I, I'm supposed to be somebody, I'm commanded to be somebody who is good to all the world, who treats people in, in a kind, and in a loving, and in a fair way. But more than, than anything, I'm supposed to treat the church that way. I'm supposed to treat God's people that way. You know, that hasn't always been done. I think you know that. And even today, uh, from, from the world, many times the church isn't treated in, in that type of way. And, and you read through the history of the New Testament and you realize that it's not a, a rarity. It's always been that way. That people of the world haven't always treated people of the church very well. It certainly was the case when Peter wrote 1 Peter. And, and I want you to turn there. That's where we're going to get our lesson from 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. That the passage that, that Todd read for us just a moment ago. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. While you're turning there, I want you to remember this about 1 Peter. Actually, I talked about it, I think it was my first Sunday night here. That in 1 Peter, Peter was writing to Christians who were being persecuted. I mean, Christians who were suffering. Uh, Christians who, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 6, says they were being grieved by various trials. I mean, persecution and trials were coming at them in all directions. It was physical, it was emotional, it was financial, you name it, and they, and they, they were being persecuted in that way. And, and so what's safe to say is this, the world wasn't treating them very well. And so as Peter writes to them, what he tells them is this, basically... Though the world's not treating you well, this is how you should treat one another. See, it may never be that a Christian doesn't have anybody that treats them well. There might be people in the world who don't treat us the way we want, but, but it should never be that we get that type of behavior from fellow Christians. And so what he says, and, and we're not going to read the whole passage, but First Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, this is what Peter says to the church about how to treat one another. He says, finally... All of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers, be tenderhearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. So though the world's not treating you very well, Peter says, let me tell you how you should treat each other. And that's the lesson tonight. We're going to talk about how we should treat each other, how the church should treat each other. How should I treat the church. Point number one, chapter three, verse eight. He says, finally, all of you be of one mind. See, the church should be of one mind. The, the, the idea of unity is really a never ending theme through the New Testament. It's all throughout the Bible. And it's all throughout the New Testament, this idea of unity. And yet I think that what we'll find is that the unity that this so often times is, is preached in our world is vastly different from the unity of the Bible. Uh, the unity that, that many times we think of is this. Well, you go ahead and teach whatever you want to teach. And, and I'll teach what I want to teach. And, and they'll teach what they want to teach. And those people over there will teach what they want to teach. And so long as we all get along, and so long as we're all happy with each other, then we're unified. And what Peter says is, no, the unity I'm talking about is being of the same mind. Right? We want to think the same things. 
When it comes to doctrine, we want to believe the same things. And when it comes to the way we worship, we, we want to agree on how to worship. And, and when it comes to the way we work, we, we want to be of the same mind. It's that that's going to benefit us spiritually and cause spiritual growth. It's that that's going to cause numeric growth. It's that that will help the church grow when we're of the same mind. It's not a thousand different people pulling a thousand different directions. It's a thousand different people or however many people pulling and working towards the same goal and the same thing. And and we all have different talents and we're different individuals, but we're of the same mind and we have the same goal and we teach the same things and we're working towards the same cause. We're of one mind. He says, that's how we should be. That's what the church should be. We should be of one mind. But, but point number two is this on your outline. And, and he says it in chapter, again in chapter 3 and verse 8. He says, having compassion for one another. See, we're, we're not only united in mind, but we're united in heart. Right? We, we, we don't only necessarily believe the same things, but we love the same things. And, and we're, we're, we're united in heart. We're, we're compassionate towards one another. You see, I didn't, I didn't intend on it being this way. I actually wrote this lesson on Tuesday, okay? And, and yet on Wednesday night, uh, Gene talked about John chapter 8. And then this morning, Troy talked about John chapter 8. And, and I'm telling you, we didn't all get together and discuss this. It just, it just worked out this way. But, but I want you to think of that, that passage again in John chapter 8. That, that Jesus is there in the temple, right? And as he's in the temple, there's a, a group that brings in this woman and she's caught in the act of adultery we're told and she's she's thrown in and and as we're told she's caught in the very act so so you can imagine she probably wasn't dressed the way she would like to be dressed when she goes out in public right they caught her in the act of adultery they grabbed her they brought her to jesus drug her through town drug her into the temple threw her down not concerned at all for her they said okay jesus we have a question for you we have a question. And, and their concern was this. We want to stump this man. We want to stump him. And so they say the law says that we should stone her. What do you say? See, because the idea is this. If, if Jesus, who was seen as Mr. Compassionate because, well, he was uh, of great compassion. If he says, okay, let's, let's get some stones and stone her. Then all of a sudden, all those people who thought him, of him as a compassionate man, uh, they, they won't follow him anymore because he doesn't seem very compassionate anymore. But if he says, well, let it go, you know, just, just, just let her be, then all those people who, who saw him as, as, as a follower of the law would say, well, he's not following the law. And so they would leave. And so they thought, man, we really got him now. And they brought her in, they threw her before, and they said, what of it? Right? What now? Here, here she is. You tell us what to do. And Jesus, as, as you know, is, he, he looked down and, and he wrote in the sand and, and he looked up and he said, you who is without the first sin, uh, you throw the first stone. And what he did is, is he made all of them, for a second anyway, look at themselves and realize, oh, wait a second, I'm not perfect either. I have sin also. And, and so we're told that, that old to young, they, they all laughed. And then Jesus said to the woman, oh, where are your accusers? And she said, well, there are none. And Jesus says, I, I'm, I'm not here for that either. He says, go and sin no more. A couple, a couple important things to note about that. First of all, they, they, it's not, Jesus didn't break the law here. I mean, as a matter of fact, you, you know this. When adultery is being committed, there's two people involved in it. And, and both of them, according to the law, should have been tried. And they brought one. See, because they weren't really concerned about the law. They were concerned about catching Jesus in a sin. But what Jesus did is Jesus made them look at themselves. You see, because if I look at everybody else and forget self, then it's very easy to not be very compassionate about people. Because I can look at everybody and I can say, sin, 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 sin. I mean, Jesus, the whole world sins, right? If, if I say I have not sinned, I deceive myself and the truth is not in me. John chapter 1 and verse 8 and many other places in the Bible tell me that. So I can, I can look at everybody else and I can see a, a room full of people who aren't perfect. And what I forget is that you're all staring at someone who's not perfect either, right? And, and so it's very easy. It's very easy if I forget about self and I forget about my own problems to, to not just be real c compassionate uh, towards you. 
Because what we know is this, and, and you know this about me. We're not perfect. I believe I'm looking at a room of wonderful people. I mean, I, 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 think, I think Christians are the greatest people in this world. And, and yet I also know this, that I'm looking at people who aren't perfect. And, and you could decide about me whether you think I'm wonderful or not. But, but you know you, you, this much. You're not looking at someone who's perfect. Right? You're not. And so when I start to realize that I'm not perfect, I start to be a little more compassionate and, and understanding of the fact that you're not. And, and that's what Jesus was doing. He's teaching a lesson on compassion. I mean, they cared not at all for this woman. Uh, they, they didn't give one iota for her. I mean, it's just, it, it, what, what she was feeling, what she was going, it, it didn't bother them or concern them at all. Their goal was to stump Jesus. That's all they cared about. And yet, here's a woman who is hurting. Uh, a woman who, who was, uh, she, she was full of sin, right? She was lost. Uh, she was condemned. Did they care? No, I didn't care. All they cared about was stumping Jesus. They didn't care about her. They didn't care about her soul. They didn't care about, about her, her position and her relationship with God. They didn't care about that at all. All they cared about was stumping Jesus. See, Jesus, when, 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 he, when he told the lady to go away, he didn't excuse her sin to the sense that he didn't care about it. Understand this, that, that being compassionate towards people who are struggling with sin doesn't mean you agree with the sin. I mean, he said in chapter 8, verse 10, go and sin no more. He's not, he's not saying that the sin's not wrong. When you're compassionate towards somebody, it doesn't mean you agree with them all the time. When you're compassionate towards somebody, it doesn't mean you don't care that, that, that they're struggling with sin or that you don't care that, that there's sin in their life. When you're compassionate towards people, what you see is this. You see a person who right now is here, and yet you want them to be here, right? If Jesus would have just told this lady, to, to go away and just said nothing of her sin problem, then she would have gone away and still been in her sin problem. If Jesus said, well, let's pick up stones and stone her, then she would have been laying on the floor dead, lost in her sin. But Jesus saw a woman who was full of sin and wanted her to get to a better place. That's what we should want for each other. We, we, should, we should be compassionate towards each other. I know you struggle with sin. I struggle with it too. And, and we want to get through this and we want to get through this together. We want to help each other get through this. We want to make each other stronger. We want to be compassionate uh, and understanding of the fact that, that we're not perfect people. Though, though we try the best we can to follow the Lord, we're not perfect. And we don't want to just say, well, okay, we're not perfect and throw. We want to help each other. But point number three is this. Jesus said, love his brothers. Love his brothers. See, brothers, generally speaking, have a very close bond, you know, I can, I can say this about my family, and, and I, I think it's generally true. Not always, but it's generally true. I like being around my family. I do. As a matter of fact, we're coming up on, on really my favorite time of the year is the holiday. So we've got Thanksgiving coming up here in, in a couple of weeks, and, and we've got the Christmas holidays, and, and we have different holidays that are coming up. And, and really what that means for me is it's a time where I get to see my family. Right? I, I like seeing my family. You understand this? You don't have to poke and prod and beg and plead with me to go see my family. I like to see my family. I enjoy seeing my family. Why? It's because I love them and I care for them. What Jesus is saying here, or Peter is saying here, is this. Love each other that way. Love as brothers. Care for each other. But, but not just that. I mean, it's, it's about being on the same page in our mind. It's, it's being one mind. It's about, it's about compassion towards each other and loving towards each other. But at the same time, it's, it's about loving like brothers. I mean, there's, there's a bond that, that, that siblings have. There, there's a, a, a unity that siblings have, generally speaking, not always. But, but what Peter is saying is that, be like that. Love each other that way. Be close to each other. Enjoy being around each other. Do things together. Grow together. Be, be like brothers. He says this point number four, be tenderhearted. You know, the, the word tenderhearted means quick to feel and show affection. Quick to feel and show affection. And so it's, it's about the affection that we have towards each other. You know, I, I think that, that you get this and, and, and we get this by now. That, that Peter's driving a point home right, about the way we treat each other. 
You know, it's, it's not as if we're, we don't want to be mean and harsh and, and cruel and rude to each other, but we want to be, well, tenderhearted towards each other, compassionate with each other, and love each other like brothers and be of one mind. There, there's a, a closeness that the church ought to have, and, and we should see each other in that way, and we should treat each other that way. We should be tenderhearted. See, it's, it's about the way we feel towards each other, but, but not just the way we feel, but the way we show what we feel. I tell you, I, I, I pray, I hope that, that, that the church knows that I love them. And yet, there's certain ways I can behave to prove that. And I can say I love, I love you all day long, and I think we should say that, but, but it's about the way we treat each other. It's about the way we show that affection towards each other that really makes it believable. That, that really makes it to where we agree and we say, okay, now that person loves me. It's about the way we treat each other. And that's what being tenderhearted is all about. It's, it's about being affectionate, not just feeling it, but, but actually showing it and, and letting each other know that we're affectionate towards each other. And point number five is this. He says, be courteous. Now, the word courteous relates to the word humility. And, and basically, I, I think we get the idea. It's, it's about not having to come first, right? A humble person is somebody who, who looks at others and, and really puts them ahead of himself. And they, they look at others and they say, you know what? <clears throat> I don't always have to have what I want. I'm, I'm not so important that I always have to be number one. And I'm not so important that it always has to be about me, but it's actually about caring about others and looking towards others and wanting to do good uh, for others. That's the idea of humility. And, and that's the idea of courteous. And, and that's what we need to be towards each other. We don't always just say, well, well, what about me? But we look outwardly and we say, well, what does that person need? And, and what can I do to help that person? Even if that puts me in a bind or if, even if it's not, you know, the, the thing that, that helps me the most, but, but I want to help them. He says this next point, number six, not returning evil for evil. See, as we talked about, sometimes the world doesn't treat us well. And, and I think that a lot of us, and, 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 and certainly as Peter writes to these Christians, they've come to a point where, where they've expected that. I mean, it doesn't just shock us a whole lot when people in the world are rude or when people in the world are mean. Oh, why? Because, well, they don't follow God. They don't follow Christ. And so they're going to behave that way many times. Sadly, though, and what should never happen but sometimes does, is that sometimes even people in the church can treat us that way. And what Peter is saying here is, is don't return evil for evil. Just because they act that way doesn't mean you should act that way. I kind of like mom used to tell us, right? I mean, uh, two wrongs don't make a right, right? I mean, how many of us had, that had mamas that told us that, right? Two wrongs don't make a right. And, and that's basically what Peter is saying. Just because they're not treating you well doesn't give you license to, to not treat them well. He says this next point, number seven. He says, or reviling for reviling. To revile is to hurl verbal abuse. And what will happen sometimes is people will say things that aren't nice about us. And they'll gossip towards us. And, and they'll, 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 they'll say things about us that just aren't true. And Peter again says, don't return it. Don't return it. You see, because this is true. You can go anywhere in the world and get that type of behavior. But the church should be the place where people can go that that never happens. He says this, point number eight, but on the contrary, blessing. See, the church should be the place where, where you're never gossiped about. The church should be the place where, where, where you're never lied about. The church should be the place where you're never treated evil. The church should be the place where you're never treated rudely. The church should be the place where you can go and, and you will be loved. Doesn't mean, again, we're compassionate. Doesn't mean we always agree with everything. But the church should be the place where you are treated like, like, like you're a person that is loved. Because you are a person that is loved. That's the church. Just because everybody else in the world, if everybody else in the world turns to evil and is mean and hard-hearted and evil towards each other, don't be that way, Peter says. And, and I think we know this. Sometimes that's hard. I mean, sometimes that's hard. When people are mean to me, I want to be mean right back to them sometimes, right? And, and when people are, are, are rude to me, my, my, my first inclination many times is to just, just be rude right back to them. And it's hard 
to control myself. And it's hard to not do that. And it's hard to, when people are mean to me, not only to just not be mean back, but actually be good back to them and be nice back to them and return the the evil that they gave me with a blessing. That's hard to do. And so we ask, why should we do it? Why? Well, Peter answers that. He says, for you were called to this. You understand that? That, that's what Christians are called to do. That's the way Christians are, are called to behave. That's the way Christians are, are, are called to, to respond to people and to treat people. That, that, that's who Christians are supposed to be. When you said, I, I confess Jesus is Lord of my life. When, when you said, I confess him as the Christ. What you were saying is, is he is my king. And he tells me how to behave. And I behave that way. And this is how Peter or, or Jesus has told us how to behave. Tenderhearted. Compassion. Loving. Uh, that's what Jesus wants you to do. That's what you were called to do. If you're a Christian. But notice this also. He says that you may inherit a blessing. See, it's hard to do sometimes. It's it's hard to behave that way sometimes. But that's the way we are to behave. And if we do behave that way, we're told we will inherit a blessing. That's the type of behavior that is shown in the people who will inherit this blessing that he's talking about. And Peter has already told us what that blessing is or what that inheritance is. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Actually, this was the passage I preached the very first Sunday evening I was here. He said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. I tell you, those who will go to heaven are people who behave this way. Those who are rude and mean and hard-hearted, those aren't the people who inherit this blessing. The people who inherit this blessing are people who, who are of one mind. The people who inherit this blessing are people who are compassionate. The people who inherit this blessing are people who love as brothers. They're tenderhearted. They're courteous. They don't return evil for evil or reviling for reviling. But on the contrary, uh, they return evil with blessings. That's the type of people that will inherit this blessing. And it's, it's a home in heaven. And so it's hard sometimes to behave that way. But I'm telling you, the reward is worth it. Now, you may inherit a blessing. If, if you are a Christian tonight, let me encourage you to make sure that you treat the church that way. That's the way you've been called to treat the church. If you're a Christian tonight, let me encourage you to behave that way. Because that's the behavior that our Lord is looking for from his people. It's that type of behavior that will lead to this inheritance, to this blessing that that we have been promised to be blessed with. If we can help you become a Christian tonight, that's what we want to help you do. If we can help you get your soul in, in a right relationship with God tonight, That's what we want to help you do. If you've been studying the gospel plan of salvation and would like to obey it tonight, we want to give you an opportunity to do that. If you would like to hear more about what the gospel is, we would love to teach you. If we can help you in either way, won't you come and sit on one of the front rows while we all stand and sing the invitation song?